Hey, Kevin. Yeah, Daryl. What do you reckon about flying? <gasps> Oi, Tess! Stop bloody bouncing your sister into the coral tree! Mm -hmm. Bloody caviar. Sorry. Help. What were you saying? I was, um... I was just talking about flying. Oh, right, right. Why? Oh, I don't know. I just think it might be really interesting to see the world from that uh, angle. Wait, are you, are you saying you want to fly? Um, well, maybe. But you're an egg. Yeah, I know, but I, I could wear a helmet or something. Oi, Tess! Stop putting the bloody decorative pebbles up your nostrils! Look, Daz, I, I just don't think eggs are meant to fly, mate. <laughs> Ow! Tess, what did I just say? Oopsie. Flight Simulator, where you can fly anywhere you can dream of, as long as you are not an egg. Please verify that you are not an egg. <sighs> Melanie, do you reckon I can have a go at flying your kite? Um, I don't know, Daryl. Isn't it illegal for eggs to fly or something? Well, yeah, maybe, I don't know, but I wouldn't actually be flying myself. I would just be, you know, holding your... Oi, car, babe, is... is this egg bothering you? Cos I'll end him if he is. No, sorry, I was just... Oh, my God, that's, like, so romantic. <coughs> Melanie, <coughs> you're correct. <coughs> Humpty Dumpty. Do you know why you're here? Um, uh, I tried to fly. You try to fly. And do you know what happens when eggs try to fly? Um, they have fun. This is the third time this year you've tried something like this. What's going on, Daryl? I, uh, Look, you're a good guy, Daryl. I'm gonna let you off with a warning. But this is the last time, okay? You should really get some help, mate. tiny embryonic life forms that have evolved over millions of years to live in complete symbiotic harmony with one another. But can eggs fly? Yes, I think they can. Hey folks, and welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. Registration for the 2022 Epic Mega Jam is now open. Sign up and get all the details on the Itch.io Mega Jam page, including all 13 special modifier categories. The festivities will kick off with the theme reveal on Thursday 25th of August at 2pm Eastern during a special airing of Inside Unreal. Did you hear? 
We now provide distribution agnostic pre-compiled binaries of Unreal Engine for Linux. Join the discussion on the Unreal Engine forums and download them from the Unreal Engine website. Fractured memories, cozy cabins, ice monsters. Unreal Engine students left no creative stone unturned during this year's Rookie Award submissions. Head to unrealengine.com feed to check out all the projects and to find out more about the Rookie Awards. Will you be submitting your project next time? A lot goes into making a stadium feel right. Hear how one of the world's top architecture firms, Zaha Hadid, tackled this and employed a design visualization process using Unreal Engine for China's upcoming Xi'an International Football Center that ensures maximum fan enjoyment of the venue. We recently caught up with Ebb Software on how dystopian surrealism art was the stepping stone to the biomechanical horrors of H.R. Geiger, and how those influenced the solid visual aesthetic of Scorn. Dive into the interview and learn more about how the team journeyed through various development struggles, switch to Unreal Engine, and continue to build on this profoundly unsettling masterpiece of a game. The next frontier in filmmaking is real-time, believable digital humans. Want to find out more? Cast your vote for the digital humans are ready for their close-up panel for South by Southwest 2023, where you'll learn how real-time tools unlock performance-driven workflows and make digital human creation more accessible for everyone. You'll also hear real-world production examples from leading studios and independent creators. Act fast, voting closes on Sunday, August 21st. Taking a trip to this week's Community Spotlights with an environment short film by environment artist Pontus Ryman. On a recent trip to Spain, they took the opportunity to go on excursions looking for the perfect photogrammetry content to scan and build their story simultaneously. They focused on contact shadows, detail textures, and the magic of Lumen. Watch Forests of Valencia in full on their ArtStation page. Virtual cameras, parkour, and what lurks in the dark depths. In the past two years, Rotu Entertainment has made digital tools for UE5, turning iteration time from weeks to mere days. This fun but suspenseful found footage short is an example of what they can accomplish. Check out the entire short on their YouTube channel and stay tuned for future photorealistic UE5 shorts. Bringing the Vitruvian Man to life was something Leonardo da Vinci dreamt of. And finally, after more than 500 years, Thomas Sackman and Feeding Wolves have done just that digitally. In this masterful collaboration, they sculpted the original head mesh along with the metahuman body morph and all of Enzo's textures. He was then brought to life with body and facial performances coupled with well thought out cinematics and lighting entirely in Unreal. Head to their ArtStation page and let them know what you think. Thanks for watching, catch you next week. Hello everyone and welcome back to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host Tina and I have a couple things I need to say. First and foremost, I miss you all. <laughs> We're back from our two week break. It is so good to be back and to be able to hang out with you all and learn new things and dive back into the cool tech of Unreal. So happy to be back. Happy to have you all here. Thank you so much for being here. And as you probably saw in our new segment of the day, we are about to kick off this year's Mega Jam. So make sure that you go and register. We're gonna have a live stream with the kickoff as we normally do. We'll go over all the fun stuff like themes, answering questions, going over rules, prizes, things like that. But you can also learn a lot about what's gonna be going on and get a sneak peek at the prizes by looking on the register page and everything that's there. So make sure you check that out if you're interested. But with that, let's go ahead and dive into the incredible content we have today. So Zach, would you like to kick us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Zach. I am a senior core engineer at uh, Modulate. You'll hear more about Modulate in a minute. Um, yeah, I've been with the company about two years. Uh, I've been working on a bunch of uh, Unreal plugins projects recently and really excited to share what we've been up to. On to Mike and Carter. 
Yeah, fantastic. Carter, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I'm Carter. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of Modulate. Super excited to be here, really excited to talk about uh, some of Modulate's tech, what we're doing. Um, I got my start uh, focused on machine learning for like spacecraft and stuff like that. So kind of low power, low latency sort of analysis of a bunch of kind of different disparate weird kinds of data. Um, which actually applies surprisingly well to analysis of like voice chat and different kind of inputs coming in for toxicity. Um, so, uh, so yeah, really excited to be here. Yeah, and then I am excited to have you here as well. So last but not least, Mike, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Mike, um, alongside Carter, I'm the other co-founder of Modulate. Um, my background was originally in math and physics, and then I went on to be a software engineer for a little while, and now I do none of those things. So I'll be spending some time here today talking a little bit more at the high level about what we do at Modulate um, before allowing Carter and Zach to really dive into the, the sort of deep technical guts um, and showcase some of the really cool stuff that we're doing here. Very excited to get into it. So what have you brought for us to learn about today? Yeah, so um, I guess to give a, a basic intro, Modulate's core product is a solution called ToxMod, which is a voice moderation system. Um, to give a little bit of the basics of, you know, why, why are we working on this? Why is it important? Probably anyone who's anywhere near the games industry knows about the problem of toxicity in online games. It's unfortunately just that pervasive. We've all unfortunately, I'm sure, had to deal with it in different situations. Um, and it really prevents a lot of people from either participating at all in games or at the very least having, you know, the ideal time that they'd like to have really building those deep, meaningful friendships um, in these sort of online experiences. And so for a long time, studios have been working really hard on how can we solve this problem? How can we give people a stronger sort of guarantee that they're going to be able to, you know, just be treated with respect when they go into these online spaces? And there's been a lot of good work done in fields like text moderation and other solutions. Um, but voice has always been kind of a bit of a tricky black box. Carter will get into this in a little bit um, about you know, why it's so difficult to moderate voice effectively. Um, but to, to sort of leave that part for him to dive into, um, the short version is simply that just voice is a much more complicated kind of thing to be analyzing than text. There's so much more going on. And so for a really long time, sort of the major platforms just have not had the right tools to be able to dive into voice chat and actually recognize when something problematic is happening, much less to differentiate real toxicity or hate or harassment from things like friendly trash talk, which might not only be acceptable, but for many folks are actually really part of the charm of gaming and something that you want to make sure you can still preserve for the people who are enjoying it. Um, and so that's sort of the, the motivating thing that led to us developing this ToxMod system. It's a unique new kind of approach to voice moderation um, that allows platforms for the first time not to solely rely on player reports, which depending on the game often cover less than 5% of the actual harmful behavior happening. And especially for some of the most egregious kinds of harms, things like unfortunately, you know, child grooming or self-harm or radicalization. Um, the victims in those conversations are very rarely in a mental state where they recognize what's going on or where they're going to be able to go through reporting flow. And so giving these platforms better tools to actually understand what are the kinds of harms, not just hate speech and harassment, but some of these more insidious things as well, happening across the entire platform in a way that they can then first of all, sort of understand how bad the problem is and devote the real amount of resources necessary to solve that problem and really appreciate the scale. Um, but also using ToxMod, recognize those instances of harm near instantaneously so that they can be jumping in and actually sort of remedying the behavior there um, in whatever way makes sense, whether that's just providing educational resources for folks, muting people, or in some cases outright banning a bad actor so that they're not able to continue to harm others. There's a ton more information that we could get into here. I do really want to hand off to Carter in a moment to let him start talking about some of the, the technical aspects of how we were able to solve this problem that frankly had gone unsolved for decades with people really trying to tackle it. 
The last thing that I want to emphasize before I before I hand that off is just I know that whenever someone talks about voice moderation, it immediately brings to mind questions about privacy and sort of questions about how is this going to interact with the fact that voice has always been kind of a separate place for people to be, you know, chatting with their friends. And that's something that we take really seriously. We're not here to invade someone's privacy. We're not here to sell your data or anything like that. Um, in fact, Talksmod has been specifically designed so that even though it is keeping an eye across the overall ecosystem, the only data that we're materially storing and certainly the only data that anyone is actually going to have access to in terms of the moderators of the game, it's only when something toxic has already happened. Um, prior to that, we're keeping an eye out so that if something toxic happens, we can grab, you know, what was the minute or two leading up to that? That context might be really valuable, but none of that's actually going to be shared with any human unless we're actually seeing something that requires some kind of intervention. Um, so I just always want to make sure to really emphasize that up front. This is, again, something that we take really seriously. We're pretty passionate about our user privacy ourselves over here. And so I, I just want to sort of emphasize that I think one of the really unique things about TalksMod is our ability to find that balance between being very comprehensive in what we cover while also still being very respectful of player privacy and making sure that folks have an awareness of what's going on and can feel comfortable that their data is not getting sent up unless realistically another player might very well have reported them because they're doing something bad anyways. Uh, I've already talked quite a bit. Um, Tina, if you have any other questions or things that you think I missed hitting on, please feel free to jump in there. Otherwise, I might hand off to Carter here to start talking a bit more about you know, how we made this possible. Yeah, absolutely. Let's dig further into that. All right, great, <laughs> fantastic. So I guess where we really want to start is like, what are we trying to enable you to be able to do? And then I'm going to kind of get into how does this ToxMod system break down into different components that enables you to do that? And then once we've sketched out some of those major components, we'll start going and tackling each one of them individually. So we'll kind of start high level and, and get lower down. So what are we trying to enable you to do? Um, the, the, the main component here is either you have voice chat enabled and you've got a voice chat community. Um, and uh, as Mike was talking about where there exists a voice chat community, there exists disruptive behavior, there exists toxicity. Um, and uh, for, for many players, they've just had to deal with this for a long time. And many players don't engage in voice chat communities in the first place because of the toxicity and disruptive behavior. So we want to as easily as possible be able to, to let you come in and say, we have community policies that we care about. You're not supposed to behave certain ways towards other players in voice chat in our game on our platform and we want you to have the tool to do that and so slot this in get going and start actually like showing your players that your community policies in voice chat matter they're actually relevant they're actually being enforced um and the scope of that problem is that I, uh, depending on your player base, depending on kind of how, how much engagement people, people sort of interact with in, in that voice chat community, um, you can have millions or tens of millions or at the upper scale, hundreds of millions of hours of voice chat happening in a game or platform per month. And that's like totally untenable. Like you, you might imagine like, okay, how, how would, how would we even try to try to enforce our, our content policy in, in voice chat, you know, okay, maybe we can have moderators that sort of jump in and try to try to listen to what's going on. But that is like orders of magnitude, uh, overwhelming around uh, compared to the amount of human effort that you could put in to actually moderating this voice chat content. And so our whole focus is to say, first and foremost, we need to triage that down. You've got a million hours of voice chat. You've got 100,000 hours of voice chat, whatever. We need to triage that down from the large majority of conversations that are totally benign, right? As Mike was mentioning, there's trash talk, but there's also like whatever you're talking about in game, right? Like you might be like tactically communicating. You might be just kind of 
uh, talking about recent events, joking, whatever, chatting with your friends, like the vast majority of conversations are totally are totally benign and very welcome. You want people to be engaging in your voice chat community. And so how can we very, very quickly say, okay, almost all of this content is okay compared to your, your uh, community policies, but let's get down to the small fraction of stuff that's going on um, that is really disruptive and that, you know, hey, if you're playing and you're engaging and you come across this, you know, once, maybe it's not even every match, but, but you know, once or twice and you have a really, really negative experience, that's actually going to turn your players, uh, players away from the game. So let's get down to that small fraction um, as efficiently as we can. And then we want to get that in front of your moderation team or community team or depending, depending on how large, uh, you know, you are, you might. Um, just have one person who just has some bandwidth of like, hey, what's the worst stuff that's going on here, right? Like, like you know, what's the most egregious violations of this community policy we want to uphold so that we can go in and make sure that stuff isn't happening? Or you might have a full-time team of people that are that are engaging on, okay, at any given moment, like, what's the status of voice chat right now in terms of like, in terms of toxicity, like what's the really bad stuff going on um, that we can kind of intervene on directly. Um, and in fact, uh, ideally catch situations as they're escalating, right? So like, you know, you've got people starting to, to potentially test the waters about harassing other other members in voice chat or something bad happens, like, you know, a team starts losing and people start getting toxic. Can you come in and say like, hey, you know, it looks like this is getting kind of heated, tone it down, right? You know, don't even have to punish anybody, but just kind of come in and say like, hey, tone it down, you know, uh, we're, we're going to a place that's not that's not okay in this community um, and, and help players kind of know where the limits are, know where the boundaries are and show other players that you care about where those limits and boundaries are and, 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 and that you're helping out. And so, so we've got kind of this triage objective, but then we've also got this kind of latency objective around uh, can we understand that a situation is escalating or something really bad is happening and allow your moderation or community folks to jump in and stop that while it's happening to prevent more harm from occurring. So triage stuff down, handle that huge volume, do it with low latency so that you can intervene into, into situations that are happening. Um, and then of course there's, uh, there's uh, sort of optimizing around cost of uh, moderating all of this content, right? Like analyzing, I, I, Mike was Mike was alluding to like okay you know moderating voice how different is that from moderating text like one of the big differences with moderating voice is there's a ton of voice content right just a ton of voice content and there's so there's so much data richness in voice so analyzing like a million hours of voice chat or 10 million hours of voice chat per month is a huge, huge undertaking. Um, and voice is so complicated. There's nuance, there's emotion, there's all this kind of stuff going on that you really have to deploy powerful analysis tools to see what's going on. Um, and if you're doing that on these millions of hours, like how on earth do you do that cost effectively? And so I'll kind of get into that in a little bit of like, how can, how can, how can you even have a service like this that studios can, can afford to use? Because if, if you had this capability, but it was too expensive, like nobody could moderate voice chat and then we're back to the same problem we started with. Um, the final, the final angles that we're, we're optimizing around um, are one high accuracy and especially high precision. So if 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 you deploy Toxmod in your community, you are trying to get the really really you know most uh, disruptive, worst violations of your community policy in front of your community and uh, moderation teams, so that they can make most effective use of their time, saying like, okay you know, this is really bad, I'm going to intervene. This is really bad, I'm going to intervene. Um, if we're saying like, hey, this is disruptive behavior and it's not, that's some of your moderator's time wasted, right? And that's also a conversation that they didn't need to see, arguing back to, to the privacy component of all of this. Like we want moderators to only be seeing um, I, I interactions that are actually violations of this policy. They only should see what they absolutely need to see to determine that that's happening. They can intervene. And then, you know, they move on to the next thing. So making efficient use of time requires us to be super, super accurate in terms of like what's actually offensive, what's actually violations of your policy. Um, that gets into a ton of nuance as well around like uh, 
Um, you know, Mike was talking about trash talk. You also have things like reclaimed language, for example, where like, you know, if you're just like, hey, we're going to ban people saying a racial slur or something like that. Um, well, if some people are using that in a reclaimed way, like an empowering way, like depending on the nature of your game or platform, like, you know, maybe maybe you're just like slurs aren't OK. You know, this is child focused or maybe you're saying like, hey, if we just blanket ban this stuff, we're actually harming members of the community that we're trying to protect by, by moderating this kind of content in the first place. And so we've got to be able to tell the difference between, um, you know, somebody using uh, uh, using voice chat in a harassing or hate speech focused way versus using it in an empowering way. So um, trying to do this kind of moderation uh, really, really accurately is, is a big challenge. And we'll talk a little bit about um, the steps we take to try to make sure that we're only escalating real violations of that content policy. Um, so that was a bunch of different kind of constraints and overall objective. Um, and uh, I, I think right now I'd like to kind of just start breaking it down into like, what are the components that go into that, right? Like that's a bunch of objectives we're optimizing for. It's a big problem we're trying to solve. Like what are the constituent pieces going on? Um, so really this breaks down into four different components. Um, one of the pieces that we'll talk about uh, later and Zach will kind of jump in and help walk us through um, is how do we even get audio in the first place? Um, so the most important thing about moderating voice chat is that uh, you get the voice chat into the system in the first place, right? You know, you need to be able to consume this in order to moderate it. Um, and so the, the, the sort of first entry point for ToxMod is a plugin. Um, uh, for your game engine and also for your voice chat system intended to be really, really lightweight. How can we get this voice chat content that's going on that a player is saying um, and start analyzing it um, without consuming a bunch of extra memory, without taking a bunch of time, without taking a bunch of your compute budget away because like, uh, uh, you know, games are extremely resource constrained and we want to be as lightweight as possible and just kind of uh, allow you to analyze this audio without making any kind of performance impacts on the rest of the system. So, so there's this plugin, and basically it's just branching audio off of the microphone. Typically, this hooks into the voice chat framework um, that you're that you're using or implementing. Um, these voice chat frameworks all have a, a individual kind of. They all do it slightly differently, but uh, a callback uh, sort of entry point that says, "Hey, I've got some raw audio." Um, what do you want to do with it? So each time, like as a player is speaking, um, your uh, your voice chat framework will will kind of collect a buffer of the raw waveform audio samples, batch them up into these small buffers that may be like ten milliseconds or twenty milliseconds worth of audio content at a time, and then it'll call this kind of callback that's like, okay, do you want to do anything with this audio? Um, and where our plugin tries to to hook in is say, okay, on that specific callback. Yeah, I do want to do something with that audio. Why don't you hand it to me? Um, and I want to really quickly, um, as soon as I can, package that up and get that up to the cloud. So that's part one. That's this sort of plugin uh, entry point uh, for the voice chat. Um, and that's really where uh, you, as kind of a developer working in the engine, working with your voice chat chat framework, you're just kind of trying to grab that, get it integrated, get that voice chat up to us. So part two is that cloud uh, is that cloud infrastructure where all of the analysis heavy lifting is is going on. So um, we're using a ton of different you know machine learning models, trying to coordinate across a bunch of them um, uh, in different ways to get that high accuracy and low latency that I was talking about. Um, you really want to avoid doing much of that work on the client side. So we've got kind of this cloud setup. Uh, you're getting that audio coming up, hitting our cloud endpoint. Um, and then our objective is as quickly as possible, as low cost efficient as possible, and as accurately as possible, let's ingest all of that audio, triage down to what's the really, really toxic stuff, the really bad violations. Um, and then the, the, the end result of that is a score and categorization of this, the, these interactions that are happening. And so we're saying like, okay, uh, you know, we can provide a little bit of context of like what kind of content we think this is. Like, is this like racial hate speech? Is this like sexual harassment? You know, these, these various types of offenses um, because different studios have different priorities around different kinds of offenses that could happen in their voice chat community. 
Um, so let's try to categorize this and let's try to score it. And that score is just a single number. And that number is kind of a priority of how urgently do you need to see this? You as kind of the moderation or community team, this score number is like, okay, higher score items, I should go look at that first. And so, you know, while you're, uh, uh, while Toxmod is kind of running in voice chat and moderating this, you've just kind of got a constant stream of these score numbers. Um, coming out of Toxmod, um, and and uh, you know you have uh, sort of moderators um, that can interact with the third component of Toxmod, which is this web console, um, where they can grab those different scoring items and go analyze them. So, cloud part ingest all this audio, get down to categorizations and scores. This third part, the web console, is kind of a tool for your community team, your moderation team, um, to see what's going on in voice chat in terms of disruptive content. Um, and so this is something where you just kind of log in um, to, to the Toxmod website, um, and you can go to a queue. The fundamental data structure of this is this moderation queue. Um, and in this moderation queue, you've got moderators or community teams that will just say things like, hey, within the past, you know, uh, five minutes or past 15 minutes or, you know, other, other different kinds of durations, depending on how real time you're able to engage with this content versus kind of looking at, okay, what's the worst stuff that happened over the past day? Um, but in this time window, uh, what is the worst stuff that happened according to my policy that Toxmod can show to me so I can make a moderation decision based on it? So really this comes down to you, uh, uh, you know, a moderator sitting there and saying, grab me the next thing off of the queue. Um, and then when you grab something off of the queue, you get a heads up of like, okay, um, here's like a transcription of, of what was being said. Here's the context of what other people are saying in relation to what this person said, right? Toxicity isn't just about what you said, it's about how you're interacting with the other people in voice chat around you. So what are other people saying? What are these different topics? What's going on? Um, as well as our kind of like categorization of this behavior um, and this score of how urgent it is. And so the idea here is that as a moderator, you can grab this item and you can get at, at a, quick glance like, hey, what's really going on? You know, what's happening in this interaction? Is this a violation of my community policies or not? And again, with that kind of high accuracy constraint, ideally most of the time the answer is yes, that's a violation of the community policies. Um, and then a moderator can make a decision on that console. So they might say something like, um, uh, you know, yes, that's a violation. And this kind of offense typically warrants this sort of reaction, right? Where a reaction might be, hey, send this player a warning that this, uh, this situation is escalating and this behavior isn't acceptable. Um, and then, and then by warning players, most of the time they'll get the message and, 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 you know, stop behaving in that way. Um, sometimes you might say this is this is really bad behavior. This is deserving of a of a temporary voice ban. So they might get temporarily muted, um, or potentially even a temporary kind of ban or timeout from the game. Of just like okay, this has clearly gotten too far. Um, this player needs to kind of take a little bit of time and then come back when when, when things have things have cooled down. And so the moderator gets kind of those options in that console to say, what's my decision? The final piece of what's going down is. Uh, we are, we then take that moderator's decision and send it back to your player management system. So you've got, you've got some setup, uh, where you're saying, okay, these players, this is their status in the game. Um, and we just have to send a post message over to you saying, here's, here's, here's what this player just said. Here's like this transcription. Here's the link to, to kind of a clip of audio around what they said for you to review or to audit later. Here's some of the context. Here's our analysis. Here's what your moderators said about this content and, and set, said what they should do. And you can grab that context. You can grab that action. Um, and then you go into your player uh, management system um, and go take that action. Um, and alongside all of that context, you've got like, okay, this is the reasoning behind this action being taken. So you can either show to players like, hey, this is why you're seeing this warning. This is why you're kind of getting this temporary voice ban. Um, or if a player, uh, you know, gets an action taken against them, and then let's say they appeal it, right? They come back and they say, hey, you know, 
that was totally, that was totally, uh, you know, not me. I don't know what's going on here, but like, I, you know, I've been behaving this whole time or, Hey, you know, I might've said something, but it was totally taken out of context, right? Maybe they submit an appeal to you. You can go back and see, okay, well, what did Tuxman deliver around those events? What was the, the content? What was the, what was the reaction? You can go kind of audit that and say, was that in, fair, in fact a fair action that we took or was it not? Um, so that's kind of that last piece is all around providing that context and providing that evidence so that you can make sure you're treating your players right when you're taking these actions. So those are kind of the four pieces. Um, I think maybe next what, uh, what, what I'd really like to do is um, there are two pieces of this that we can go into more detail on. Um, there's, the, there's the sort of core like Unreal plugin side. Um, there's the cloud side of like, how does this scale out? How does all of this work? Um, I think in addition to that, um, one of the most important components of ToxMod is how do we actually analyze this content? Like I was giving some examples of like, uh, you know, okay, maybe there, there's, this is an instance of sexual harassment, or maybe this is an instance of racial hate speech, but we have to be careful uh, to not mistake that for something like um, reclaimed language. How do we actually make those determinations? In fact, how do we even think about what, what kinds of violations can happen in the first place? Um, a lot of studios uh, are engaging with voice chat and saying like, hey, you know, we know bad stuff is happening, but like, you know, what even, what kind of stuff is there? Like what kind of content, what should we do about this different stuff? And so this, this scoring piece, this kind of understanding of what's, what's toxic, what's disruptive, and what's not, and how you can classify it so different studios can make different choices about what's appropriate for their communities and not, um, is a big core component of how ToxMod works. And so um, I'd like to hand it over to Mike to go into a bit of detail on that. Cool. Uh, before I dive in there, Tina, just quickly checking in. Any questions from you or from the chat that we want to dive into before we sort of move into this next section? Um, there's a couple questions that have come up sort of in relation to the nuance aspect that you were just talking about, where um, a lot of it is people wondering if, for example, they're being sarcastic with a group of friends or, um, you know, things like that, maybe where it's not even necessarily super extreme language, but it's more that the tone of it is what's differing it between being harmful and friendly. Um, how would you handle situations kind of like that? Yeah, so that's a that's a great segue into this deeper discussion. And it also kind of highlights one of the first things I wanted to talk about, which is, um, you know, why don't we just transcribe and then run all that text moderation that's already sort of been developed on all of this stuff? And I think this example of something like sarcasm is a great example of that, that as Carter mentioned before, voice is an extremely rich medium. There's way more there than just the literal words that are being spoken. And a huge part of what we've done on the ToxMod side is try to make sure that we have models that are able to understand all of those different aspects of what information is being communicated through voice. So not only are we looking at the textual content of what you're saying, we're certainly looking at the sort of emotion and the nuance of how you're expressing it. So we do have models that can differentiate sarcasm from normal speech that can understand, you know, happiness versus anger versus sadness. And those things fit into different categories of harm in different ways. Someone sounding very sad and saying something that otherwise sounds like sort of a violent, aggressive threat kind of raises some what the heck is going on bells and says we should look at that more closely. Someone being very sad and saying something that sounds a lot like self-harm, okay, those actually build on top of each other and now that's a really sort of severe thing that we need to take a quick look at because that sounds like this person's seriously in trouble. Um, so combining these different models together in a sort of uh, intelligent and category specific way um, is a huge part of what we're doing, but it also doesn't just stop at those two elements either. Other things that we're looking at, Carter mentioned the context of how other people are responding to the conversation. Um, that's both their content and the nuance of it as well. So uh, Carter mentioned the example of a reclaimed slur. If someone comes into a conversation and you know greets people using the N-word, 
is that harmful or not? Well, the answer is it depends a whole lot on what that community was and what the sort of norms of use are. That could actually be a really positive and sort of pro-social thing that they're, you know, empowering each other in that way that the platform wants to continue to support. If that's someone else who's coming in and saying the N word, you know, in response to other people that they don't know very well or in a community that is supposed to be very kid friendly or just otherwise doesn't have that expectation of reclamation, that's obviously very different. And you're not going to see that just from the speaker and the way that they're saying it. They could both come in and say the exact same words with the exact same intonation. But the thing that's going to reveal was this harmful or not is looking at how everyone else engages with that player as a response. And once again, you have to be nuanced here. Sometimes it's very obvious. Everyone else gets very angry all of a sudden and you say, okay, that was clearly harmful. But other times it's much more subtle. Maybe people just get uncharacteristically quiet. Maybe it's one or two people in the chat suddenly go quiet and everyone else is having a good time and you realize, oh, maybe these people are getting excluded. There's a lot of different ways that harm can manifest. So we're not trying to say there's just one key emotion or one key indicator we're looking for. We really are trying to come together with a holistic understanding of what is this interaction. The last piece that we're bringing into this analysis is also who are these people in the first place? So we certainly have information about if someone in the conversation has previously been you know, suspended from the game multiple times for gender sexual harassment, um, and then you know, they're coming in and they're saying a lot of stuff that kind of sounds on the borderline, we, we might mark that as a little bit more worthy of moderator attention compared to coming from someone who's never been punished for that behavior, who's been sort of noted as a really positive participant in their community. We're not necessarily going to, you know, jump the gun and take some random other action on them, but we can say, hey, this person is probably more likely when they're starting to build in that direction, they're more likely to cross the line. And so it's maybe worth putting a closer eye on them. Similarly, we do have some models, and I want to be really careful in how I talk through this here. Um, we have models that do look at characteristics of both the pitch of your voice, word choice, different behavioral characteristics to try to understand um, whether someone is likely, first of all, to be prepubescent, in which case on certain platforms, they want to make sure that those kids are a little bit more protected. You know, maybe generally speaking on that game, adult language is fine, but if you know that there's kids in the room, you're going to be asked to, you know, adhere to a slightly different code of conduct. Um, we also look at not, we're not trying to make any predictions about what someone's own gender identity is, but there certainly are people who online will say that voice sounds feminine and jump in and start targeting that person. And so by recognizing how does the voice present without having to say we're making any assumptions about the person speaking, we can have some understanding of, okay, if there's a voice that presents as likely to be feminine, and all of a sudden there's a whole lot of talk about people going back to the kitchen, you can kind of put two and two together and figure out what's, what's going on in that conversation. Um, so it's really looking at all of these different sort of pieces. And again, sort of going back to why you can't just do text moderation, the first part of that answer is that text moderation loses all of those diverse additional elements, right? You lose the emotion, you lose a lot of how other people are responding because of the way it's sort of voice is time synchronized in a way that text chat isn't. You certainly lose a lot of the indicators about is there a kid in the room or is this person presenting in a way that unfortunately it's certainly not that person's fault, but unfortunately many people are going to take a sort of bait to start acting in a worse manner and we should be keeping a close eye on that so that we're really protecting those vulnerable people. Um, so having to look directly at the voice is really important so that we can fully understand all of this. So to wind that back and do an actual answer to the question, if someone is being sarcastic and is, you know, that's just you having a good time with your friends, you're not saying anything particularly bad, but sarcasm is maybe a negative emotion, you're fine. We're, we're going to see that in so many different ways. We're going to see that in the content of what you're saying. We're going to see that in the fact that 
if these are, you know, friends that you're playing with all the time and they know your sense of humor, they're probably all laughing and having a good time too. The rhythm of the conversation hasn't broken down. We're going to see that in the fact that you generally have a good track record of behaving well with different people. We're going to see that there's not anyone who's, you know, presenting as particularly vulnerable in that conversation. So there's no special reason to think that that's going to be taken in a worse way or be sort of more, more adversarially directed. So all of those different pieces of information help us to make sure that we're not just, you know, over indexing on any one piece, but are really looking at that whole context. Um, there's more that I'd like to say on how we think about sort of scoring and categorizing, but I'll, I'll pause there. Hopefully that, that did manage to answer the question in the end. But Carter, did you have more you wanted to say there? Yeah, God forbid we like, you know, keep going into more detail on this, but, but, I, but I do want to also mention um, the, the human moderator component to this, right? Like human judgment is extremely important for determining both like, is this actually the, the kind of toxicity or disruptive content that, that an automated system thinks it is, right? Like, you know, okay, our models make all of this analysis, but is that analysis accurate? Like um, a human picks up on all of those variety of, varieties of cues and brings in to bear a ton of intuition. And so you can have kind of a human go in and say, well, talk about escalated to this me, this to me, but like, I can look at it too and say, yeah, you know, based on this context, like, do I believe that this is, um, that this is uh, an, an actual offense or not, right? So it's kind of like, uh, and, and then based on that, that feedback, um, we can actually tune which parts of our analysis are more or less impactful to that moderator or community team um, based on what is appropriate for their community or not. So there's kind of on, on top of everything that Mike just talked about, there's this human in the loop component that's making sure like, okay, you know, a real life actual person whose job is to help make this community better, like in fact agrees with this analysis and says, yes, you know, that we don't want this content in, in the game. And they can also make, you know, kind of judgment trade-offs on like, I, uh, I, uh, you know, okay, am I going to present a warning, right? And say, hey, you know, w watch out, what you're doing might not be acceptable. Like, okay, if I'm on, if I'm borderline on this, on, on the kind of context that I'm seeing, like, okay, presenting a warning is relatively safe. Um, but if I'm actually going to, you know, kind of uh, temporarily ban a player from the game or something like that, my bar for evidence is very, very high. And so, you know, you can kind of have that 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 trained moderator judgment come into the loop too. So it's sort of that combination of all of these systems. Because I think, you know, what one of the very, very worst things that you can do with moderation is to ban a player who wasn't doing anything wrong, right? Like I think I think that's one of the worst failure modes. Because you're 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 penalizing somebody they don't understand you know what they did wrong they can't improve it they're just kind of a victim of this system um, and that can turn players off from from that game from that community and so um, I think you know just kind of layering you know almost defense in depth kind of thing on like all of these different ways to make sure like okay when you're actually taking a moderation action especially a, a kind of big action you're really really certain that it's appropriate. So, cool. Um, Tina, any further thoughts for, from you or chat on, on that thread before I go into a little bit more, more sort of depth here? Um, there's a few, but I think it might actually, those would probably be best for uh, the end q and so I think we can probably keep moving forward with the topics you have here. That sounds good. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about how voice chat is different from sort of standard text moderation in a couple different ways. Um, there, there are some sort of more obvious pieces here. So we already talked about losing a lot of the content that's already existing in voice. Um, another thing that may or may not be obvious, but is certainly very meaningful is when you look at text chat, especially in games, it is filled with abbreviations and, you know, intentional typos or lead speak or all kinds of different things. And now part of the lead speak and intentional typos is trying to trick text moderation, which is a whole other thing we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but there, there's, you know, a whole separate language specifically for text chat because you're trying to move fast, your hands are on the keyboard, but you're also using them to actually manipulate what's going on in the game. You do not want to be taking a whole lot of time to type something out in full. 
In contrast, saying a lot of those acronyms aloud is actually more awkward or slower than just saying the normal word. And so when you look at a lot of the complexity of text moderation systems, they're designed not only to endure the fact that there's all these sort of abbreviations and things like lead speak, but they actually learn a lot based on looking specifically for those cues. Those cues do not exist in the transcription of a voice chat conversation. There's no such thing as replacing the I with a one in voice chats. You could, I guess, say the word wrong, but that doesn't really sort of get through in the same way. And so just in even thinking about if you were going to try and analyze this text, the kind of text you need to be prepared to analyze, the, the population of data that you're looking at here, looks fundamentally different when it is transcribed voice chats compared to when it is text chat logs. So that, that's a separate piece that I think is important to understand for anyone thinking about how do they solve this problem. Um, a few other things that I think are really interesting here. Um, first of all, text versus voice are very different types of data channels. Um, so when you are in a text chat, someone decides, I wanna be as loud as possible. So they type a lot of stuff in all caps. It's really annoying, but it turns out it shows up as Mike said this. And then Carter says something else, and it separately shows Carter said this. And so, yes, you might need to scroll through Mike being very loud with his all caps, but you can still clearly see what is it that Carter was trying to say. It's not a truly mixed data channel. Audio, on the other hand, is generally a truly mixed data channel, which means if I want to be really aggressive in a voice chat communication like we're having right now, and I take out my soundboard and I start blaring the loudest possible music I can, Carter cannot speak. It's not just that I'm making everyone else's experience worse. I'm also actively cutting out anyone else from participating in the conversation and taking away that communication channel in the first place. This is, I think, one example of a kind of harm that just does not have an analog in text. And so as we've been building out this system and working with many of our early partners, we started out with kind of inspiration on the categories of toxicity based on what they had previously seen in text moderation. And we've since learned, okay, actually, voice is a very different place. And while there's some analogs for sure, racial hate speech can unfortunately happen in text or voice. There's a lot of these kinds of things like this sort of sort of channel channel um, abuse or what we call audio assault within our system that are very unique to the voice ecosystem. So you need to be able to understand that new ecosystem and the kinds of harms that manifest there in a new way to be able to be as comprehensive on this. Um, I'll in a moment talk a little bit more about how that kind of informs our taxonomy of harms, but I also want to talk about one last really important difference between text and voice, um, which is maybe less directly relevant, you know, what are we detecting? But as Carter has mentioned, and it's really important here, we have human moderators who are coming in and listening to these clips and making an assessment of what's actually going on here. It's really, really hard for human moderators just to read toxic content all day. Hearing it all day really is, though, another level. Um, just hearing not only kind of the emotion and the unfortunate passion in a lot of these clips, hearing sometimes the pain directly from the person who's being abused or harassed in that way, as well as just the, the sort of simultaneous realism of hearing that clip and realizing like that is a real person who's doing this. And the simple fact that it's very hard to screen that off when you're when you're reading through a text, you know, transcript, you can very quickly kind of jump to, oh, yep, there were these couple words. I roughly understand what's going on. I'm moving on with it. When you hear a clip, you can't really speed the clip up. It's hard to be able to accurately even do things like bleeping out certain terms. And a lot of it is not keyword specific. So when moderators are having to listen, for hours and hours in a day to just more and more toxic content, that, that is also just a really important thing to be aware of as you're thinking about sort of transitioning a platform from text only to voice. And this is something that I'll frankly say we, we have not solved. 
I think we've done a lot of really good work, um, both with our internal sort of data labeling team that faces the same challenge and in supporting many of our customers who are working on how can we, be, you know, treat our moderators well and support their mental health. Um, there's a lot of cool things that we've discovered in this space that I think have been really powerful. It's absolutely not a solved problem, though. And so I want to kind of simultaneously call this something for everyone to be aware of, that they need to make sure they're really taking care of their moderators, frankly, regardless of what medium the, the moderators are handling, but especially be attentive to that invoice. But also know, like, this is a great area for innovation. This is a great area for people to be paying attention because moderation is just such important work in all of these different ways and treating the people who are you know, dealing with hearing this awful stuff well, is just so, so important. Um, one quick sort of, I, one, one quick observation that we've had on something that has been really helpful, and I think could it be applied to things like text moderation as well, is again, you know, um, as a moderator is listening to this content or encountering this content, what frequently happens is you get kind of beaten down by it day in, day out. You know, okay, people are saying bad things, now more people are saying bad things. Is this what the world is actually like? Is this actually the thing that just everyone secretly thinks? It's very easy to start kind of falling into that trap of, you know, you've heard so many examples of that. Is that just what reality looks like? Um, and so one of the things that we found hugely helpful is just giving moderators, obviously, you know, very secure for privacy, but some some decent channels to just be able to sometimes share some of these clips with each other and just genuinely ask that question like hey i just heard this can someone confirm that i'm not crazy and this is a weird thing can someone just sort of validate my belief in humanity and confirm like this is not the sort of thing that normally happens and that seems like such a simple thing to ask for but you you really wouldn't believe the impact it has on the moderator's well-being to be able to just sometimes raise their hand and know that that's considered not only appropriate, but you know, a well understood way for them to take care of themselves and take care of their colleagues is just reinforced like, yeah, unfortunately, this does happen sometimes. But no, that's not what the world looks like. Everyone isn't this way. Um, so just the those very simple kinds of interventions, again, can just go a really, really long way and helping people to, to sort of better endure having to listen and, and sort through this content. Having said that, I, I do want to move into some of the other sort of scoring stuff. But again, I'll, I'll pause. It sounded like there might be some other questions there. Uh, I think really the, the main question to kind of combine um, a few that I was seeing in chat there. So okay. This uh, technology is adaptable based off of the game that it's being implemented in, right? So if we know that this is a game that's specifically being targeted towards a younger audience, for example, it would be possible to have the moderation um, maybe a bit more, um, trying to think of the appropriate term here, extreme is the one that's come to mind, but that's not necessarily, you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> But something that's a little bit tighter for games more directed towards children versus something that's for teens or adults, right? It's completely up to the developers themselves and what level of moderation they want to enact. That's absolutely right. So we have individual offense categories, familiar things like, is there adult language being spoken at all? Is this sexual harassment? as well as, again, things that are unique to the voice ecosystem, like this audio assault category. And for each of these things, the studio has sort of two major levers. One is to say, this doesn't belong here at all, that we actually don't care about this within our code of conduct. Adult language is an easy example. In some you know, T or M rated games, they simply just may not mind people using adult language. Now, certainly that doesn't mean if you're using adult language to harass someone, that that's okay. We're still going to detect that as a harassment offense. But as long as it's merely adult language, the studio could say, hey, this doesn't belong in our code of conduct at all. The second thing is what's kind of the urgency of this kind of offense? How aggressively do you want us to get this in front of your moderators compared to other types of offenses? Um, and I think that subtlety is important 
you know, we're, we're not trying to say, hey, do you only want to catch 60% of this kind of harm? You want to get rid of all of the harms. If you consider it bad, you want to get rid of all of it. But knowing that, you know, un unfortunately, trust and safety teams are often chronically underfunded. You're not necessarily going to have the full moderation staff that you need to dive into the number of things that are happening. As Carter mentioned, there's so much voice chat on these platforms. And so many people have unfortunately kind of learned the wisdom that you can't get in trouble for what you say in voice chat. So there's a lot of stuff that's just been built up over time of people being really bad actors there. So it can be kind of overwhelming when someone first turns on Toxmod within their system and realizes, oh, wow, there's so many things I need to tackle. And so even though we're all agreed, the goal is ultimately get rid of all of the harmful behavior. Sometimes it is really helpful to say, OK, there's certain things that I need to prioritize most aggressively because these are either causing sort of the largest spanning harm or, again, something like child grooming that I think we just kind of collectively as a society agree, like you, you have to stop that. There's really no, no other choice there. Um, and so making sure that they have the ability to, to prioritize what their moderators can tackle so that they start with the most sort of desperately urgent things to, to dive into and then can continually tackle more and more of the other harms once they sort of deal with the most immediate fires. That's very interesting. And I have a quick question just for myself, actually, based off of that. I know there were I yeah. there were some related in chat, but this one is a selfish question for me. <laughs> so um, it's more of a hypothetical. If we have a game that's targeted towards teens and adults, for example, and I know you're mentioning that it can pick up on um, some subtleties in tone and pitch, such as if a player is possibly prepudescent. Um, what would that look like for a game where the moderation level is set for teens to adults, but you know somehow a child did end up in this voice chat with other people using language that is normally acceptable on the game, but now there is you know, a child involved, how does stuff like that get handled? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And it's often when we have to kind of handle case by case. This is a discussion we have with basically all of our TNM rated studio customers of, hey, how, how do you already think about this? Hopefully they already have something in their head around if a kid, you know, slips into the game. Are, are they the kind of studio that just kind of shrugs their shoulders and says, well, I guess that's a player now? I hope not, but there unfortunately are some studios that kind of treat it that way. Are they someone who says, hey, you know, actually we have a child-friendly zone within the game that we just need to route them into? Are they a studio that just has a hard line and says there can't be any kids here, period? Um, depending on that, there, there's different tools that we have that we can sort of deploy. So in some cases where there's a rated M game that says, hey, we, we truly cannot have children on this platform, we do have the ability to say, hey, we can actually directly flag as kind of a separate thing, not quite an offense, but a, a separate kind of thing to take note of. Hey, we're recognizing someone who is striking us increasingly as a probable child on the platform. Um, and, you know, the more they're talking, the more confidence we're gaining in that. That's not something that, again, we're really encouraging studios to go out and say, oh, let's just take whatever Toxmod spits out and run with it. Because as I'm sure everyone can imagine, there's lots of possible people that have voices that could read to a system like this as prepubescent. Now, we've been able to train on those different voices really, really well. I've been um, you know, no, no, no shade on our amazing ML team, but even knowing the quality of people we have on our team, I've been stunned how good performance we've been able to reach in terms of this kind of prepubescence detection model. But even so, that's just a very difficult model to get to 100%. So we don't ever want to be advertising to people, this is a certain thing. It sure can help, though, especially if there's only a small number of kids on the platform to say, instead of randomly wondering where those 10 kids that slipped in are, we can point you to 10 or maybe 11 accounts and say, hey, th these are the most probable ones to be those 10 kids. And then have your moderators do whatever they need to do, whether that's ask for just a valid identity check or you know, take their own look at the behavior patterns of the person or whatever else they need to do 
to figure out, is that in fact a real child, in which case they can remove them from the platform. I can kind of chime in as well of something that we see from uh, some, some studios that, uh, you know, can provide rated T or, or rated M uh, uh, games is that um, along with that rating comes an expectation, again, of how you can behave in that platform. And like, you know, if you're doing a lot of trash talking, if you, you know, if you want to like swear like a sailor in this, in this community and like that's like totally legit. You know, uh, uh, and and that's that's something that's okay in that particular community. Or even you've got you know maybe different kinds of like maybe different servers or maybe different different kinds of uh, guidelines for different like hey you know this is this is trash talk friendly or this is like uh, uh, you know not trash talk friendly something like that. Um, I, I think we do see we do see studios say saying things like hey look the fact that there is a kid there does not mean that your expectations of how you're allowed to behave changes. Right, like you know, you can still say harassment isn't okay, but like just because there's a kid there in a game that you should be totally fine swearing in doesn't mean that you know you can't swear anymore, right? Like, like uh, you know that that's the expectation that you're supposed to have for this experience, and and their presence doesn't violate that. It means that you know uh, uh, that you don't intend for a kid to be there in this community, and like maybe they need to be routed differently. But it's not like oh, suddenly there's a there's a kid involved in something that's otherwise rated rated M. Now behavior that you once thought was acceptable and you were correct about is no longer acceptable. Um, I think where 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 you can kind of start univer more universally saying the presence of, of someone who's underage changes the equation is in stuff that starts to sound a lot like 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 child safety or child grooming like there there it's very much like oh, okay you know unfortunately like people can take the advantage of of the presence of somebody underage you know in in any community and so that's also a, the kind of offense that you need to be really really careful about your your detection and what you do when you think think something like that might be happening. But but I do want to be super clear, like there are there are there are many communities where it's like, hey, you should be allowed to behave this this certain way. You should be able to swear. You should be able to do all of this stuff. And just the fact that Toxmod, you know, suggests that it's likely there's a child somewhere in this in this game doesn't change, doesn't necessarily change like how you're allowed to behave. Awesome. Very interesting. Um, it gets really complicated, question. right? Like it, it does. It does. And it definitely it's I love this topic because it's very it's very delicate, right? There is no necessarily right or wrong way, but there definitely are hard limits both on the player side and the developer side. Um, it's a very interesting, intricate topic. Um, and it's it's very interesting. So first, thank you all for you know bringing this on. I think it's a, an important conversation for people to be able to have. Um, but anyway, the last question I have on this segment before I allow you to continue <laughs> with uh, the stuff that you had prepared already, uh, there was a question that I was seeing in regards to um, you know we've talked about how it's adjustable based off of what the game is, the age range it's targeted for, things like that. Um, is the moderation also available to be tweaked potentially by players individually as well? So maybe the studio, for example, has an overall moderation level that they have implemented, but this is a game where maybe the age limit is at 14 and over, but there are some parents who want their 15 year old to still have a couple of limits on what they can hear and interact with. Would it be possible for them to put in something like a um a no swearing uh instance on their specific profile for example or is that a totally different ballpark <laughs> yeah so it the the there's a couple levels of answer here first of all toxmod does support sort of setting different kinds of policies for different scenarios within your game a common one that we hear from the platform is hey private chats between friends versus public matchmaking might you might want to look at those things a little bit differently because some things that you know you can get away with as from the trash talk in a private chat between friends if you're doing that in a public venue um it, it's not that you're necessarily harming the person you're trash talking but the other person around you hearing that 
could could be put out depending on how sort of aggressive and severe that trash talk is. So that's not for you know the mild stuff. That's not for you know sarcastic backbiting. But think about like you go you go with your friend and you're standing in line at the bank if anyone remembers what that was like long ago. <laughs> um, and like there's certain kinds of things that you would joke about with your friend that you're maybe just not going to joke about while you're standing in line at the bank. It's that same kind of sense of hey maybe I want to take a little bit more care in that public area. Um, we right now we're not putting that directly into the hands of the individual end users. We have talked about that from a parental control standpoint, and we think that's an interesting direction to go. There's a couple of sort of interesting design questions that that raises that we're still talking through with our customers, though. For instance, if you know I said I really want very very restrictive policies. And Carter says, you know, I don't mind people, you know, going pretty severe on all of this stuff. I'm very happy doing nothing more restrictive than the baseline kind of game standards. How does that sort of cash out if the two of us jump into a voice chat together? First of all, how does Carter know that my expectations are that he should now act in a more restricted way? How does he get informed of that in the first place? Second of all, you know, what happens if we randomly got match made with each other? And if your answer is, well, don't match those people with each other, um, even for some of the most popular games out there, often trying to match people by region, by skill level, by the kind of game they're trying to be in, by how big their current team size is, you, you don't always have that many choices from the get-go. And so adding another constraint to matchmaking, it's not impossible, but it is a real constraint. Um, and so I definitely think there is something very promising here. I expect that in the next couple of years, we will see more and more people being able to come into the game and in some way have the game kind of understand, this is the kind of experience you're looking for. Let me help you with that and be able to facilitate that on a more personalized level. How exactly do we get there? I think there are some of these remaining questions we need to hash through. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, those very insightful answers. There's there's some other questions. Again, I'll save those for the end. But um, yeah, thank you for those answers so far. No problem. Yeah, this is, again, a, a fun topic to talk about, a very complicated one. But still, you know, it's, it's great to be able to dive into this level of detail with everyone here. Um, I want to get myself to shut up soon so I can hand it off to Zach and Carter for them to actually talk about the, the tech side. Really briefly, the last thing that I kind of wanted to cover is thinking a little bit about the time horizon of offenses. This is kind of the last really important part of how we think about kind of our taxonomy of harms. There certainly is, you know, what is what is the baseline type of harm that's happening? Is it, you know, treating someone wrong because of their race, treating someone wrong because of their gender identity, just treating someone wrong because they're not good enough at the game? You know, what where where is this coming from? But as you look at the different kinds of harms that can happen, you also see really different time horizons. So something like racial hate speech, if I have a 15 second clip. I can probably say, yep, that's racial hate speech, all right. Um, there's plenty of things that even in that short of a time span, you can pretty confidently say are bad. And especially taking a minute or two of context on either end, it becomes pretty straightforward to determine, you know, hey, was this actually that kind of thing? Sometimes that's true of something like sexual harassment, too. But depending on you know, what exact that manifests as, it may be significantly less obvious in a single short sort of burst of time that something is sexual harassment. For instance, hearing someone call another player babe a lot, that may be sexual harassment. If they don't know the other player, they're just trying to insinuate themselves in some way. It could also be, you know, two people who know each other playing and, you know, that that's just what they call each other. So seeing that in a single instance is far from, you know, enough to say this person is necessarily treating someone badly. Maybe that person is going to react negatively to being called babe, 
But another thing that you can look is you can look and see how does that conversation evolve over time? Does that start to kind of escalate when the person isn't reciprocating? Is the person pushing harder and harder on, hey, you want to be my girlfriend? Hey, you know, starting to use vulgar language, all that. And you can see that evolution over time. And then you start to be able to say, okay, well, since we watched this from the beginning, we can recognize this is definitely sexual harassment earlier than if we waited for that one definitive clip where, okay, this is clearly gone, gone really badly. So it allows us to overall intervene faster, but we still need to be watching kind of the progression of the conversation um, rather than just sort of looking at that one clip as it happens. Taking this even further, you know, we've talked about child grooming a little bit. Um, child grooming sometimes can unfortunately happen as quickly as in a single chat session, but it often takes place over a much longer time horizon. And so in those situations, again, if we're saying we're only going to detect that the child is, you know, being asked to do these really horrific things, okay, we can detect that as a pretty singular event. But at that point, the harm already happened. What we actually want is we want to notice way earlier that this conversation is going down a dangerous road. And so imagine that you were able to say, hey, look, you know, this person who reads as prepubescent has been in a one on one conversation with someone who reads as a older man. And that older man has been in three other one on ones also with people that seem prepubescent. This particular pair has had, you know, five different conversations over the last week. They're all long lasting conversations. And even though we're not necessarily recording all the content from it, we've definitely noticed a lot of those conversations veering into discussions of things like their family life, as opposed to just being content around the game. Now, none of this is definitive evidence that that older individual is actually a child predator. One easy example is they might actually be an esports coach working with younger kids who just noticed that this kid happens to be having trouble with their home life. They could genuinely be trying to help. So you don't want to jump in and immediately label that person as a child predator. But you could notice this kid sure does seem to be in a vulnerable situation. If that person wanted to be bad, it would be unfortunately easy for them to take advantage of this kid. And so is there something we can jump in early and do to sort of intervene and give the child a stronger support system, whether that's, you know, a little pop up saying, hey, you'll get this rare item if you jump into this new matchmaking where you're going to get paired with a couple of other kids your own age or, you know, there's there's a whole variety of different kind of educational things you could do. And again, we have to be very careful to balance this on we don't want to just be randomly jumping in every time someone talks to their parent through the game or something like that. But there certainly is a middle ground that is be able to engage at any point in the process before the exploitation has already happened, which is what unfortunately almost everyone is forced to do today. And so as we look at kind of the, these different types of harms, recognizing that evolving time horizon over them is first of all, just really important in general, no matter what medium you're looking at. If this is text chat, if this is anything else, but especially because audio is a heavier data type, it takes a lot more to store. Again, we don't want to store anything that we don't absolutely have to, but for privacy reasons and frankly, for our own cost reasons, um, so thinking about for these more complicated offenses, what evidence is necessary to be able to tell that story, to be able to recognize the trend over time? That requires a lot more careful design and thinking about each of the individual types of harms as compared to doing something like that in text chat where it's a lot freer to just save the entire text transcripts because all text transcripts from the last year are smaller than you know one audio file from a single interaction between those people. Um, so I just kind of wanted to walk through that because I think that's something that again is kind of underappreciated about the audio space. I'm 
frankly, really proud about the work that our team has done in really developing a sophisticated understanding of each of these types of harms. And it, also just again to underscore the way to solve these problems, it's not just about ban the bad person. That can be part of the solution, but also recognizing people who are in vulnerable or difficult situations and providing them support, providing general education ahead of time to folks about what's actually going on. What is the code of conduct? Um, you know, actually making sure anyone has ever seen it has any awareness that the code of conduct exists. You know, there's a lot of different things studios can do to collectively cultivate and create a more inclusive space. And I want to make sure that it's well understood that removing those people who are behaving badly is a necessary part of that strategy, but it's not the whole strategy in and of itself. With that, I'm ready to finally shut up. <laughs> um, so <laughs> no, it was good stuff. I feel like this might be a uh, you know uh, I'm not necessarily sure uh, how the topics jump around uh, all, all the time on this live stream. This might feel like a bit of whiplash, but. Um, but but I do feel like we, we should talk a little bit about um, kind of from the from the tech side how this is working, um, and I think especially kind of you know when we're talking like Unreal, uh, a lot of the questions about like okay, um, you know we do want to we do want to kind of uh, make our voice chat community safer, more welcoming, more inclusive. We do want to kind of do this moderation, um, but uh, but you know how do we loop this in? to our game and especially on a game client where you have so many constraints um, and in particular if you're like okay we're going to do more processing on audio um, usually your audio budget for what you can do with 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 audio in terms of like cpu resources ram etc um, can be really really constrained um, and audio also has all these kind of interesting real-time constraints. And so I, I'd love for us to maybe uh, take a little bit of time here to talk about um, how, like, like technically, how can you actually have something like this um, in, 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 your, in your game client? Like, what do we do? How do we think about looping into this audio stream? Um, and how do we kind of really efficiently get that up to ToxMod, so you kind of get a sense for like, okay, you're bringing in this plugin into your game. Like, what is it actually doing? What is what is this? What is this code? What is this library that you got from us actually doing inside your game client? So, um, I think for that, Zach, uh, um, you know, it might be uh, your time to shine here if you're up for talking about the the core SDK lit native library, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, as the as the core engineer, this is something I care a lot about. Um, you know, performance and how our how our code works on end devices. Um, I have a screen share. Dan, are you able to pull that up? Awesome. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, we tie into voice chat. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. Easiest is uh, generally voice chat. Um, whatever framework you're using, whether it's Epic Voice, uh, you know, Vivox, Photon, a home homegrown solution, uh, usually those will tend to handle player muting. So not if you mute other players specifically, but if you mute yourself, um, your voice chat will generally handle that, um, as well as dealing with stuff like push to talk um, and those kind of kind of things. Um, and so what we like to do is hook into a voice chat callback um, generally. Most, most frameworks we're familiar with provide this interface where um, it allows ToxMod to grab audio before it is sent to the web, um, but after it's recorded from the microphone and after it passes those mute checks. So if you're muted, it won't send audio to ToxMod, um, or if you're not hitting push to talk, that kind of thing. Um, so after we get this audio, um, it seems pretty straightforward for how we'd go about getting that to the um, to the cloud, but there are a couple of intricacies. Um, so I just wanted to walk through like what makes this kind of cool from a technical perspective. Um, the first kind of uh, aspect to this, uh, okay, it's sliding for me, nice. Um, the first part of this is this real-time audio thread. Um, and if you're a programmer, these words real-time should probably mean something to you. Um, basically, uh, 
the voice chat framework expects um, that when it calls this callback that we're going to return very quickly and that we're going to take about the same amount of time every time that callback is called. Um, and so what's really important here is not to do heavy lifting work there. We're not uploading anything to the web. We're not even doing um, any dynamic memory allocation in there. Um, that means no resizable containers, um, nothing, nothing fancy in there whatsoever. And it also means um, that for, for multi-threading applications like ours, uh, you have to be really careful not to do any uh, thread blocking in there. Um, essentially, yeah, everything in there has to run really quick and easily. And if there's anything that could take longer, don't put it in there. Um, and the trade-off of that is that um, sometimes you do end up with situations where you have a best effort model, um, where we're really saying, we're going to do our best to capture everything off the microphone. But if something strange happens, we'd rather skip a little bit of voice chat than crash or uh, block all of voice chat or something like that. Um, and so with that in mind, we use this uh, circular buffer um, to, to store that data for longer periods. So essentially, this real-time audio thread is just taking audio from the microphone into a circular buffer in a way that does that reliably safely um, and gets out of the way as fast as possible. Um, and then finally from there, or not finally, but next, um, we're going into this processing thread. Um, and so the goal of this is to essentially, we have this circular buffer full of audio samples from your voice chat. Um, and you know, to be clear, this is running on each player's device. So this is collecting samples from one player's voice as they're said. Um, and we collect those um, into a circular buffer, but what do we do with them from there? Um, and the answer is relatively simple um, at, at a shallow level of depth. Um, the first step is what we call, uh, well, a lot of people call VAD or voice activity detection. Um, and this is some pretty standard off the shelf stuff. It's not machine learning based, um, but the goal of this is to determine, is this a human voice in the clip or not? Um, or in these specific samples even, rather than a clip. Um, and so this can tell us regions of the audio that we might be able to discard because they just contain, say, an air conditioner or maybe nothing at all. It's just silent. Um, and this helps us really narrow down, you know, Carter and Mike mentioned the massive volumes of audio we're processing. This voice activity detection can help get rid of some of that that's not relevant and is just complicating things unnecessarily. Um, and then after that, there's an optional stage. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, triage on device is an interesting idea. For a lot of reasons, um, it's not always used. That's why it's marked as optional. Um, as Carter mentioned, audio, CPU, and memory budgets can be really tight. Um, in certain scenarios, if that weren't as tight, uh, there's a lot of cool things we can do around, um, you know, informing our cloud models of what... Um, what might be toxic um, or what might have higher probabilities, um, those kinds of things we, by using on-device machine learning models. Um, but you know, for, for a lot of customers, that's not possible and it's not required to have ToxMod work its best for sure. Um, in fact, using more powerful cloud models can be really powerful um, and, and work on its own quite well. Um, and then, so finally, uh, regardless of whether that stage happens or not, um, we are cutting audio into 15 second clips. And that's slightly oversimplified. Um, essentially, we need audio to be long enough to be meaningful. Um, you know, that's why we're accumulating it. That's why we're going through all this work with different threads to, um, to collect it is that, you know, audio relies on context. A couple milliseconds of audio doesn't mean anything. Um, and so we've determined that from a 15 second clip, you can get a good amount of context, um, especially if you know the neighboring clips, um, but it's uh, short enough to be a manageable bite-sized piece where if that were to get lost on upload or something, um, the application could continue okay without it. Um, yeah, and there's also a, a little bit of a complicating factor here, which is that we will sometimes cut a shorter clip than 15 seconds. So if, um, you know, you say part of a sentence and then you trail off and just stop talking, um, we're not just gonna keep waiting for that 15 second clip. We can 
say, hey, they've been silent for a bit and cut that off early to upload. Um, yeah, let me slide to the right a little bit. So finally from here, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, each clip gets put into a queue of clips that are going to get uploaded eventually. Um, and so this is the upload queue. Um, and from there, we have one final thread, our upload thread, which goes and picks clips off of that queue and goes ahead and uploads them to the ToxMod cloud. Um, and so in this cloud is where all of the heavier analysis runs. And then there's separately the web interface where moderators can uh, log in and check out what's going on and sort by the most toxic items. Um, so that's that's the bulk of what we do. And hopefully I've explained a little bit why this needs to be um, a plugin or an SDK, why it might be a little bit um, of a heavy lift for studios to just upload their audio to us directly. Um, we found that having an Unreal plugin is really um, quite useful um, as an easy way um, for customers to interact with audio in a way that doesn't require every studio to have dedicated um, you know, audio experts in-house or um, as deep of an understanding of the ins and outs of voice chat callbacks, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I don't know if Carter mentioned this yet. All of this is bundled up as a uh, C++ library, um, which makes integration into Unreal pretty straightforward. Um, it helped us out immensely when making a plugin. Um, and at the end of the day, it provides a pretty native experience where from Unreal, um, it's very easy to, to interact with ToxMod and get audio into, into the system easily. So yeah, um, I think that about concludes the screen share and you know the on-device technical part. Um, any questions or anything you want to add, Carter? I think maybe kind of uh, one place that we could dig in, just kind of thinking about, um, I think we've got a little bit of time left and uh, um, uh, is this, uh, you mentioned kind of the, the sort of optional triage model. Um, and I talked about triage a lot earlier uh, when we were kind of giving the, the, the high level overview. Um, but, uh, you know, triaging out what's benign versus what's potentially disruptive is one of the key parts that makes the whole system work. So, uh, um, Zach, I think you very concisely skipped over that. And I'm going to I'm going to come back in and say, all right, actually, like, I think um, maybe we can kind of talk about that, like, OK, you know, what is this like on device triage little, you know, kind of box that that, that Zach mentioned? Um, and what is kind of the other triage that Toxmod does that makes it work? Uh, kind of uh, uh, really cost effectively um, while keeping low latency, high accuracy, stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, triage of toxic content. Um, if you view ToxMod as a whole big system, you've got kind of this big ingestion of all this audio content and this one kind of, you know, right or wrong signal at the very end of like, okay, is this content disruptive? Is it good that we showed this to a moderator or not? Um, so in some sense, you can view that entire thing as a big classification problem around like, you know, ingest, ingest uh, an interaction, ingest a voice chat kind of conversation and just classify it as, as violation of that, of that community policy or not. Um, as hopefully, uh, you know, it was kind of gathered from what Mike was saying, that's a very complicated computation. There's a lot of different pieces that go into it. And so if you tried to, to, to sort of have your models look at a voice chat conversation and say, you know, okay, for every single thing that every person says in a whole, you know, 10 million hours of voice chat in a single month, like, all right, you know, what was the what was the the content of what you said? What was the tonality of what you said? Like, what was uh, you know who are you responding to? Who are the participants in this conversation? You know, what are their norms? How did people react to what you said? You know, did, did people go silent or did people kind of kind of in, in, you know engage aggressively with what with what you just said? Like, what are all the different pieces? Like, you know, how would other people perceive you, and how does that affect like the probability of of other people's content being toxic when they're when they're addressing you? Um, trying to do all of that analysis 
hypothesis for every single thing is completely untenable. And the way we solve that problem is we break it down into a bunch of different layers of triage. Um, and the idea of these triage layers is that the early layers can be very, very quickly and very cost effectively figure out, is something going wrong or not? Is this a potential violation of your community policies or not? And in those early layers, we can afford to say something like, yeah, um, this could be a potential violation. We're not certain yet, but it, but it, it could be the case. And we'd much, much rather, you know, in, in kind of uh, the, this, this early layer of triage say, this could be problematic, let's take a closer look at it, um, then, then, then say, okay, we absolutely have to be right at this early layer, and so therefore um, we might miss something. Um, because oftentimes those subtleties of like, hey, what you might miss or not, only become apparent when you're analyzing more and more of that context. And so this er these early layers of triage are all around just like, hey, can I can I pick up on anything that might potentially be disruptive? Is there any signal um, that, that something could be going wrong? So that that kind of uh, box that that um, Zach mentioned um, is actually a model so small that you can run it on your device potentially. Uh, you know, we're talking like single to double digit megabytes of RAM. Now, do you have that in your audio budget? Depends on your game. Um, but uh, but but you know, relatively lightweight. Um, very, very low CPU usage um, on, on modern devices. And that's just kind of running through and saying, you know, hey, just cursory glance at even, you know, small numbers of, of, of seconds of audio content. Like, is there any chance that anything offensive could potentially be happening here? Um, and it's not like we're looking into kind of all this big context or anything like that. It's just like, are there any hints that, that somebody could be in, in, engaging negatively? And that might be like an emotional tone shift, or that might be, be just kind of like someone, someone speaking loudly in the first place, or, or, you know, some sounds that might be suggestive of like some toxic content. We're talking really, really kind of low level here because this is not a complicated model. Um, and then as you're kind of trying to run that analysis, you know, with this small on-device model, there's also, what is the rest of the context in which this is happening. As mentioned, you can't, you can't run a big complicated uh, system to take into account sophisticated context, but we are kind of also sort of polling um, our cloud side of, hey, for the rest of the participants in this conversation, is anybody else kind of engaging in something that, 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 that uh, could be problematic? If so, we should probably also loop in this content that we might otherwise filter out even on device and say, this is valuable context. We might filter this out later. We might absolutely filter this out later, but just on the chance that this is potentially problematic, um, let's, go, let's, go, let's go grab this and, and make sure that gets uploaded so we can start combining all of this and, and get a better picture of the situation. So that's kind of what, what, what that model comes from. It's like, hey, is there any chance that something's going wrong? If so, audio gets uploaded, um, and then we kind of run run a run a very similar thing, but with a little more oomph behind it. You know, um, oh, now we start getting into some GPU powered larger neural nets, that kind of thing. Um, that start taking into account, like, okay, now we can actually piece together the real spoken content of what you're saying, um, and maybe not not you know a massive model with super high accuracy at first, but like this next you know second layer of triage, we can actually start getting some spoken content. We can start see, hey, what some of the vocabulary are you saying? And again, you know, we might not know if that vocabulary is being used in a, you know, reclaimed or, 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 uh, or harassing way, but like, is there any chance that something's going wrong here? Um, start, start looping in that, start, start understanding some of the spoken content, start taking into account, you know, at this cloud point, this second layer of triage, what other people in this conversation are saying too. Um, does that relate to what you're saying at all, or is it totally independent? Start integrating some of that stuff. And we've got a couple layers like that that each start getting kind of progressively more and more complicated, taking into account more, more variables, running larger of these neural nets, larger language models that start really crunching through like, okay, making sure I'm not, you know, misclassifying this word in, in this other language, you know, than English as a slur in English, right? For example, um, you can have a lot of things that sound very similar, but like, hey, you're, you're just speaking a different language. Like, so we can't apply our English models to that. We have to do something else with this, right? Um, start running these more complicated models and paring down more potential false positives. Um, 
And you kind of do this all the way down to uh, the end layer of Tox Mod, um, where that has to be this kind of really, really high precision model that's taking into account all of this context, then starting to loop in, okay, what do we know about these players so far in terms of kind of potential vulnerability, potential community norms of, of how they've been engaging in this voice chat interaction in the past? Um, and really making sure that we don't score, classify, or escalate anything that, that could in fact be benign. So you've got kind of the scale of like, make sure you don't miss anything, even if you've got a false positive, all the way to make sure you don't accidentally escalate anything wrong, um, because doing so would be harmful or, or kind of make poor use of moderators' time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of this, this waterfall. And of course, as, as you're able to, to triage out some of the potentially problematic uh, uh, or like absolutely, I'm sorry, absolutely not problematic content very, very early on, you've got less of that content to analyze later so you can deploy more powerful models. Um, and then that final layer um, around classification and very, very accurate escalation, we have, as talked about, that moderator feedback loop as well, where we can start doing kind of assignment to different um, aspects of the conversation that we've been detecting and saying, okay, you know, this is clearly something that uh, we thought was really severe, but a moderator said, actually, that's fine, according to our community policies. Did we, did we misunderstand what their community policies are, or did we misunderstand what was going on? You know, you get, you get more of these moderation actions happening, and you can start to, to kind of differentiate between these different scenarios of, you know, are we just like chronically misunderstanding the kinds of um, like this kind of toxicity, um, this kind of category, like do we need do we need a retuning of this whole category? Or is it something where like, okay, yeah, you know, that was definitely this kind of content, but this again, this is like a rated M game and that's okay here. Um, and and maybe just refining those policy settings. Um, the cool thing in my mind, uh, there are many cool things. One of the cool things in my mind about, about this whole system um, is that it, it not only does it kind of waterfall down from really lightweight analysis to really heavyweight analysis that, that can do a sophisticated job. Um, but the, the kind of learning and efficiency and accuracy cascades all the way back. Um, it's almost kind of like, you know, if, if, if you're familiar with doing training of machine learning models and you're talking about like, okay, you know, maybe you have a multi-layer ML model, um, and then you back propagate signals all the way through it. You're kind of doing doing the sort of back propagation of like, hey, was this actually toxic or not? All the way through these triage layers back to the start. Um, and so from a from a small number of moderation signals, this end layer, you can kind of train that on like um, these these high level false positives and this high level like credit assignment of our analysis. But then as you build confidence in that layer that layer can start teaching the previous layer too, of like that previous layer is like, hey, uh, you know, I'm filtering this stuff out, I'm filtering this stuff out, and occasionally, but but hey, you know, more complicated layer, just double check me, right? You know, make let, like make sure that I'm actually doing this analysis correctly. Or when I'm passing stuff on to this next layer, like tell me if you're triaging that out, because if you're triaging that out, is there any way I could have figured that out earlier and saved some of that computation, saved some of that more powerful model time um, by understanding that this is benign earlier on. And so you have this, this kind of later stage that can process a lot more content than say the manual moderators can process. And using that huge amount of content can teach that earlier stage to be more and more efficient and more and more accurate. Um, and then, you know, as you might be kind of expecting here, you can do that same kind of thing propagating back even further where this, this kind of middle layer is even more efficient. And so as that gets more and more accurate, it can run on even more voice chat. And without any human in the loop at all, it can kind of teach the previous layer based on that huge quantity of data, you know, hey, could I have been more accurate? Hey, could I have um, caught this earlier and triaged that earlier? Um, and that, then that kind of goes all the way back down to that on-device model, where that on-device model, it's like, okay, what, what content could I possibly have triaged out with a you know with 30 megabyte model you know with a, a fraction of a percentage of CPU usage budget like what what could I possibly try to figure out to, to triage out with that small amount of resources um, and the 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 way you can start figuring that is, out is by having that later that later triage stage just process so much huge amounts of voice chat data with no human in the loop and being able to make its judgments with its more complicated kind of resources and and low and uh, more relaxed resource constraints 
um, to really refine out for this previous model and in that kind of online training loop, what uh, what kind of what kind of content work did you have the capacity to detect that you can triage out? So um, so yeah, I think that that's something that I, I I think is is kind of really really interesting about about building and and running this system. And of course, the more triage layers you have the more different steps you have to take to analyze this content, which means the more seconds it takes to get this content in front of moderators. So we've got this kind of whole other constraint of like, okay, great, triage is awesome for accuracy and cost efficiency, but it comes at the cost of latency. And so what's the optimal like latency trade-off in terms of how quickly you wanna be able to intervene in these situations? versus how cost effectively you wanna be able to process and triage. And so that kind of like uh, is, is also evolving in terms of like, how are moderators and community managers actually intervening, right? Like, you know, how, how many seconds is, is, is a good number of seconds to be allowed to wait before you can jump in and say, hey, this is getting out of control. That informs how much triage you can do, how cost effective you can be. So all these constraints are kind of tied together by, by that latency versus accuracy and cost efficiency trade-off. Um, so I think that would, that kind of covers, I wanted to cover that piece because I think it's a really kind of fascinating uh, part of how you can build a system to handle, handle this much audio. Um, and if I'm understanding my time correctly, and Tina, you can absolutely uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, correct me here. Um, this might potentially be a good place for us to hop over into, into Q&A. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a couple really good ones lined up. Um, but of course, I want to make sure you all have the time to talk about all the topics you want to as well. So only if you're prepared to go over to that. We've kind of touched on some cool, some cool tech topics and some cool scoring and some cool policy and some cool like, why is this really challenging or tough? So I don't know, Mike, unless you want to like wrap up or anything like that, I'm cool with going to q and I, I think we've definitely hit a, hit a good range of topics here. So, you know, if, if I'm supposed to wrap up, I guess I'd just say toxicity is bad and there's a lot that we can do about it. Um, but I don't have anything, you know, more elegant or clever to say on that subject. I don't think you could get more succinct, so that yeah, was a solid wrap up. Yeah, right, let's take it away. Awesome, fantastic. Um, well, one of the first ones I want to ask, because it's a really interesting question um, from not the tech guy. <laughs> there are so many variables when it comes to tackling something like this, all of which have so much nuance, as you stated. Uh, what has been what has it been like managing such a complex and sensitive endeavor from a technical perspective? Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I think the I think the biggest thing, um, and from a technical perspective, like I guess I I feel like I ought to start, but um, Zach and and Mike, uh, you're welcome to to chime in too. Um, is where can you start? definitely making a difference. Where can you come in and start making a positive impact on the voice chat community? Because if you try to engage with everything all at once, um, you, you're, it's just not going to be possible. It's not going to be possible for a, for a team 10 times our size. It might be less possible for a team 10 times or so. But like, you know, it, it's just, you you can't do all of this at once. And so I think the big thing for us, you know, um, DocsMod has been around for, uh, uh, you know, something like a, a year and a half now, I believe. Um, and, and really where we got started was, what are the things that we can really, really confidently escalate that we know that studios don't want to see? Like, like, where, where is the really serious, unambiguous harassment? Because Mike was talking a lot about, hey, there's a ton of nuance that you can, that, 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 that can apply. But on the flip side, there are some things where you can see 15 seconds of a conversation and say, that is definitely unambiguously approaching 100% confident, not okay in our community. Like there, there is a lot of content like that. There's a shocking amount of content like that. We always, yeah. we see a lot of like, anytime a customer turns this on, they're like, you know, wow, okay, like you're, 
you know, nuance, important, you know, all, all of this stuff, important. But wow, there is a lot of just very unambiguously bad stuff going on in voice chat too, where it's just like the fact that you can operate at that scale and triage proactively at that scale at all can surface that up. And so I think kind of, you know, both how we started tackling this and also how we get customers, um, you know, we onboard customers when they start using DocsMod is like, hey, don't try to solve every single thing at once. You've probably never moderated voice chat before. There's a lot that you need to figure out about what your voice chat community looks like and what you really want to, you know, how you really want to enforce your community policies once you start seeing what's actually going on in voice chat and what DocsMod is escalating. So start out with the really, really unambiguously bad content and start getting rid of that, start making a difference right away. And then as you're engaging with more of this, like not only do we learn better about your preferences and start getting some of the nuance of how you want to moderate your community, which is different studio to studio, but also you learn a little bit more about what the voice, you know, what bad content in voice chat looks like and start to get a better handle on like, okay, these are edge cases, you know, this is ambiguous, this is not. Um, and so, so it's kind of this like this is this is why this scoring is kind of so important as well and this focus on like really high precision from Toxmod is like like you start out by by just asking Toxmod and that sort of little moderator cue that I was talking about hey grab me the worst thing that happened in the past you know five minutes um, and and or or you know we're like worst being kind of um, uh, definitely a violation of our community policies in terms of like severity and in terms of confidence. And so there might be ambiguous stuff going on in your in your community, but when you just start out, give me some unambiguous stuff. Let me start as a moderator making a difference in the community from like the first click of Toxmod, you know, show me what's going on. Um, and then kind of refine that as you go. Um, so uh, I don't know, Mike, Zach, are there parts of that that I you know, missed or that you want to add? Yeah, I, I would just say very briefly, this ties back to kind of a little bit of the difference between text and audio too, where because of the, the way text moderation, A, it's been around for a while. Um, and unfortunately, people have been trying to learn to defeat it for a while. And they often get really immediate feedback when trying to learn to defeat it. Like, hey, I tried to type this word. Did it show up? No? All right, I'll try retype retyping the word with a one instead of the I, and I'll keep retrying until something works. And what that means is someone who's trying to trick the system is given sort of the perfect training grounds to learn how to defeat the system very, very quickly. For a bunch of reasons, that's not what happens in voice moderation, but even putting that aside, that has never happened in voice because voice hasn't been moderated. And so I think people, um, especially at studios, often kind of have this concept of, oh yeah, part of the reason nuance is so important is because everyone has kind of learned adversarially to hide their toxicity. Everyone is being really subtle about it and we have to be really good at investigating that to pull it out. People are not being subtle in voice chat. <laughs> and to, to go back to what Carter was saying, people are just so overt so much of the time. And again, I don't want to downplay the importance of understanding nuance, but I think that is a thing that really catches people off guard if they've kind of honed their intuition based on what they see in text. When you first turn this on in voice, you will be surprised how open so many people are about exactly what it is that they're doing because they just don't think they're going to be penalized for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a very hard line to try and travel along for sure. So I can see how there would be a lot of difficulties, especially from the technical standpoint of making sure that it's something that's useful without being overbearing or uh you know negatively impacting a gaming community or even just the developer themselves so it's i can't even imagine <laughs> the difficulties that come yeah, with that actually or I, i'll say or over promising that's maybe another really interesting thing here is we we would love to go out and say our models perfectly understand all human speech all of the time we try really hard not to say that because even though they're doing an amazing job, 
this is such a hard problem again and we something that you know we take a lot of pains in when we're working with our studio partners is trying to tread that line as well of look this system is really good it's really reliable it's going to do great work for you it's also not gospel like there is a lot of complicated stuff here and being able to make sure that people appreciate what it is that we're handing them and don't over index on what it's saying. Again, it's doing a lot. It's able to provide a ton of good value. And in many cases, you can build extremely high confidence in what Toxmod is saying to you, but still having a concrete understanding of where those boundaries are because understanding the nuance of human speech is so complicated is something kind of both on the technical side, but then also thinking about how, how do we, you know, market and communicate about this product to customers to make sure that they understand what they're buying and understand how to use it in a way that's going to be the most positive for their community once they actually deploy. I think if I can, if I can jump on even, even more, um, I think the other thing is just kind of providing providing developers and studios with uh, options and transparency into what Toxmod is doing so that they can understand how to kind of tweak the system, tweak the settings, get Toxmod to, to escalate content that they really care about removing from, uh, from their voice chat communities and, and kind of uh, uh, sort of shaping that behavior towards things that are acceptable while also providing really, really strong defaults, right? I'm sure that's something that, you know, any developer here has heard uh, many, many times, but it's like, okay, you know, there, there is this unambiguous stuff. There is this stuff that if you're, you know, almost all developers would say, that's not acceptable in my community. Let's have our defaults definitely escalate that. And then also give you enough optionality and enough transparency into how things work that, you can kind of tweak and refine the system, you know, even if you start out with these good defaults and you're, and you're catching bad content and you're, you're able to, to moderate it, how can you, you feel comfortable shaping this towards the actual community you want your game to be? Absolutely. Um, well, a couple of questions that have come in are wondering more so from, I guess, the privacy aspect and also just how this would function from the standpoint of, okay, I've opened up this game that is implementing Toxmod in it. Um, for one, are users notified that this is a service that is used for the voice chat of the game? Yeah, so we strongly recommend that they are. Um, the, the law around this is a little bit ambiguous in certain places, but we absolutely strongly recommend they are. I believe all of our customers that are actively using Toxmod today do include in-game notifications around it. Um, we, whenever we're deploying Toxmod, we, we sort of put together an education campaign with the studio to think about how can we bring this to the attention of the players, first of all, to help sort of mitigate some of the concerns players might have from potential misunderstandings of what we do. But second of all, to this specific point, to make sure that they're aware that this is happening in the first place and that that's understood to be part of the community that they're in. Absolutely. So I guess it is just another... The... Oh, no, go ahead. Please, what were you saying? Oh, sorry. Um, just to uh, kind of um, maybe clarify or reemphasize, when you say, you know, uh, we strongly encourage that they are just um, the the plugin that we provide is again just sort of this very very narrow very simple like get Toxmod up to us. We don't have any control over your player's direct experience in the game. We're consuming that audio. We're triaging it. We're getting the bad stuff in front of your moderators and then letting that provide evidence back to your player management system so you can do something about those players. But there's no point at which we, like our plugin would show a pop-up or something saying, hey, you're now being moderated by Toxmod. We don't touch the kind of like user experience in the game in that way. The plugin is that very, very lightweight. And so we say things like, hey, you know, we strongly recommend that, that you kind of uh, convey to your players unambiguously that voice chat is being moderated. Um, and we can kind of help 
uh, as as people who you know understand a lot of the privacy, you know, both kind of ethics around this and and you know legal facets of this, like help 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 developers kind of understand what to do. But we don't directly, as part of our plugin, show a pop up like like that. That's not like a behavior that that is in that toolkit. And to clarify on one further point, <laughs> I would sorry. Um, I know we're getting through so many questions, but. Um, we, in fact, don't just strongly recommend we require that the studio get adequate consent from its players. And that means not, you know, just hiding something in the dark corner of some terms of service, but actually get legitimate consent from their players. The reason I used the phrase strongly recommend earlier is when it comes to specifically a pop up in the game, that is the most straightforward and conventional way to get that legitimate consent from your players. You could imagine other ways to communicate to your players to get a hold of them. And so we don't explicitly require that you specifically do the pop-up, but we do explicitly require that the studio get legitimate consent from its players for this. Um, and we do check in on that. And if we're seeing, hey, you know, we're, we're not convinced that there's actually legitimate consent here, we're going to bring that to the studio. We're going to ask them to explain what it is that they're doing and make sure that we still feel comfortable continuing to process that data at all. Awesome. Yeah, so it, it really is one of those balances between you and the developer to make sure that it's, you know, the player experience isn't entirely up to you. It's a lot of it sounds like it is up to the developer and how they're implementing it and making sure that they're being transparent with their players. So it, a lot of it falls onto the developer to make sure that they're using this appropriately, really. Exactly, and again, we, we have tons of educational resources and support tools that we've built out to help the developer in that. But in the end of the day, we're, we're never going to directly step into a platform's relationship with its users. We're going to provide as many tools as we can. You know, we're going to, again, from the privacy standpoint, make sure that they're not treating their users wrong. Um, but in terms of the specifics, they always have sort of the control over how they want to present that. Yeah, which I think is probably honestly also relieving for a lot of developers to hear is that the control is still ultimately in their hands. This is just a tool for them to then implement according to how they want to. Yep. Awesome. Uh, was there a key event that created the drive for this system? Uh, that was a question from Liar. Not really. Um, what, what actually happened in the backstory of Module 8, without going too deep into the weeds, because um, there's a, a longer version, but, um, you know, Carter and I had known each other for a while. Uh, we, and when I say we, I mean Carter with me rooting him on, dabbled in a lot of cool sort of machine learning stuff over the course of several years. Um, as we were working in some of these spaces, we started to kind of hit on some things that we thought would be interesting for social gaming. And so we started reaching out to game studios to understand like, hey, would you be interested in this kind of technical, technological innovation? And a lot of it was around voice. And what happened in those conversations is we were talking more with these studios about what is the significance of voice chat for you today? We heard so many different studios talking about the transition to more social games, how important voice is for building really deep relationships. And of course, the, the problems with toxicity, which, you know, as they spoke through those, we both certainly have had our own experiences dealing with that kind of toxic behavior online. It's not something we were in any way unfamiliar with, but I think it was really seeing how almost every single studio we spoke to, that was at the top of their list. That really solidified for us, oh man, something needs to be done here. Um, and from there, it was kind of just fortuitous that the, the technology that we, Carter, um, had developed at that point. You know, some By that time, we had, a, we had a team. Yeah, just um, but certainly not me. But anyways, the, the you know technology that we had developed at that time had already kind of broken through some of the key technical sort of challenges that were preventing a cost-effective, privacy-respecting voice moderation system. And so as we were hearing more about this from the studios, we kind of simultaneously realized, oh man, we're so well equipped to take this problem on. And it really is a problem that speaks to us. Yeah. I. 
kind of love that. It almost sounds like a happy accident, really. <laughs> I yeah, and I and I think the big thing was again just really like uh, the fact that this was such a big priority for studios because I think like as a gamer, you know, it, it, a, a decade ago, you know, uh, I should check my timelines here. Decade and a half ago, wow. Um, you know, when, when I was like, you know, okay, great, Xbox Live, you know, playing Halo 2 all the time, that kind of stuff, hopping into voice chat. Like, it was a different kind of community and a different kind of vibe and a different, you know, set of priorities around the community from different studios and stuff like that. And there was kind of a lot of growing, like, voice chat, you know, was, was becoming more important for some of these communities. And I think, um, you know, for a long time, not having been kind of a professional in this space at all, um, uh, you know, there, there was, there was just kind of this impression around like, Hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, some gaming communities, you just kind of have to have a thick skin to, to participate in. And so I think it was really, really, uh, wonderful to see when we started getting hints from these studios of like, Hey, you know, our top priority is actually the, the safety of, of, of players. Um, in our community and and we're really worried about voice chat but that we don't have any tools to engage with that like is there anything that you can do working on like voice chat and machine learning and stuff like that that could help us solve this and like oh wow this is something that they really care deeply about they just don't have the tools to engage with it yet i think that was uh when we first started doing this kind of uh, a, a really wonderful surprise to to see um and now i think it's becoming even more clear that that this is the the top of the the priority in, in trust and safety yeah absolutely well thank you all so much for the answers to these questions i'm looking through a lot of the the rest of these and most of them have actually been answered while we spoke about the topics in general um, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to offer the floor back out to you. Are there any other uh, closing statements or any other topics you want to make sure that you address before we wrap up for the day? I'll toss out we're hiring. Um, <laughs> if anyone's, you know, interested in participating more in this work, obviously, you know, we're, we're more than eager to, or to, to partner with more folks who are working in this space. but. Um, if you're, you know, looking for an opportunity to get directly involved, please check out our website, just modulate.ai. We've got a, a whole bunch of different openings available. And almost to extend that even beyond just hiring, like we care really, really deeply about trust and safety and community and gaming. So I would say that, you know, if anyone's kind of listening in and, and is also really passionate about that, um, please reach out. You know, we, we would love to talk to you. We would love to kind of hear your perspective. Um, you know, we would love to talk about ways that we could kind of engage together. So um, very broadly speaking, like this is this is our thing. And so, you know, for anyone else who's passionate about this, you know, please reach out to us in chat. Yeah, make sure you do go check out their website, their career page, also just everything else available on the site. There's so much information all piled into there. So please make sure if you have any other questions that either weren't discussed today or that weren't quite answered, make sure you check out their website, see if there's anything there that can answer some of those questions and make sure you stay in contact. There's a lot of good work going on here and not to speak on your behalf, but I'm sure you'd be happy to answer any questions that other people might have. Uh, absolutely. And thank you again, Tina, for hosting. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to speak with us and our community today. Seriously, I know two hours is not always a short period of time. So I appreciate you taking said time to talk about this and this really cool and innovative tech that you've made with us. A huge shout out to Dan for all of the tech. This was awesome. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dan. Yes. <laughs> As always, they're the unsung heroes, uh, the tech leaders of the show, for sure. <laughs> also, of course, thank you, everyone who came and watched today. The show would not be what it is without you being here as well and interacting and asking your questions. So thank you as well for taking the time to come hang out, to come listen and come participate. 
Don't forget, we post all of our streams in video format that can be viewed on demand on our YouTube channel, Unreal Engine, as well as on Twitch, Unreal Engine. Don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine as well <laughs> on all social media, as well as come say hi in our forums where you can get the latest news and also find all links associated with today's stream. But with that, we are back in business, back in our normal, usual schedule. So I will see all of you next Thursday. And once again, thank you, the three of you, so much for coming on the show today. Bye, everyone. Thanks again for having us. Thanks for having us. Bye.